he would just terrorize people working for him. And the reality is, um, I ended up having to get a restraining order from him. It got so bad um, because um, he he did something once. He was in Asia on some holiday, on some binge, and ended up in prison. Um, and he did a 15 grand payout and basically called me up to say that I had to send 15 grand over to Asia immediately to get him out of jail. And I was like, you don't even pay me that much, like a year. Wow. You know, it, it sounds like Dan had the boss from hell. And, you know, this was his very early start in in his career to be exposed to such an incredible boss that that the way he was treated and there is a good ending to this story and often in life and in work we meet people that are so horrible to us and this is life people and it does end up okay in the end obviously not in the moment in the moment it is awful but actually, something good did come out of this. At some level, there was a gift. You just have to listen to the whole story. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Dan. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. It's a beautiful day outside and I'm inside, so that's a questionable choice, but otherwise I feel great. <laughs> I know, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast and being inside. I agree with you, actually. It's a gorgeous day. We're having such unseasonable weather in the UK at the moment. And um, although when I walked the dog this morning, it was like freezing cold. It was like zero degrees, sharp frost, but now it's it's beautiful out there. Um, so thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm really excited to hear about your journey and what you're up to today. Um, so we're going to go back in history. And my first question I ask all my guests is, tell us a little bit about your personal life. So where were you born? A uh, bit about your education. Have you moved around? Where, where have you ended up? Where you now live? And then we'll transition into, you know, your first job and everything. So first, okay. a little bit of background, if that's okay, Dan. Yeah, so my background is I am a Londoner through and through. I was born in London. I've grown up in London, which is always uh, an amazing uh, surprise to anyone I meet because it's obviously very rare. Mm. Um, and I went to uh, a boys' school called UCS, which was um, a, a a great experience. I genuinely, I used to go to work, uh, to school every day and talk about how much I loved school. And then I'd get semi-bullied by all my friends for oh, being like, you're not, supposed to, you're not supposed to love school. I was yeah. like, what on earth is there not to love? I love learning. And I was with my friends every day. So I can't imagine anything that could possibly be better. Um, so I, at the end of school, I uh, went to Nottingham University mm -hmm. Um I had a, a fun and interesting time getting into university because at AS level, I got four A's. And then for some reason, um, I got predicted that I was going to get three B's. And so I didn't actually get, it was an admin error, essentially. And I didn't get into any of the universities that I applied for right. um, because, because of my predictions, except for uh, Cambridge, because uh, you have, it's the only one that you didn't apply to go through UCAS. Right. Um, so because Cambridge has a completely different system, um, I had this hilarious story where um, well, I, did, I did a TED talk last year, and this is the start of the talk, but it's completely true, which is I'd been rejected from all of the unis I was applying to. So Edinburgh, Nottingham, um, Birmingham, York, like, et cetera. And, mm. and then on April, on, on, of all days, on April the 1st, um, my parents got a call from Cambridge University saying that I'd been accepted at Magdalen College, Cambridge. And because I'd been rejected of everywhere else and it was April Fool's Day, um, they basically told the person to F off <gasps> <laughs> because oh. he thought my dad thought my dad thought it was my uncle pulling a prank. Totally. Um, it was hilarious. Anyway, um, 
I um, I did I, I didn't end up going to Cambridge because the truth is I didn't get the course that I was applying for. I was applying for something called social political sciences, which there aren't many spots for. And the way it works in Cambridge is you basically get into your hall first, and each hall has an, uh, a certain amount of allocation on each course. So. Right. Whilst I got onto my hall, I didn't get into my course. And the course that I was offered was basically the dregs of what they had left, which was um, something like modern Chinese studies, which obviously on retrospect would have been fantastic. But the reality is um, I am not a born academic by any Mm. means. Mm. Um, And I had to work incredibly hard to get good grades. Um, And I just thought the idea of going to Cambridge and studying something that my heart wasn't in and having to work so ridiculously hard I was just like I'm not going to have a life so I decided to go through clearing and I ended up getting into Nottingham and I studied English and art history which was um, a questionable decision the complete other way because um, basically I just got to doss around for three years which was a lot of fun Uh, so I graduated in 2007 which was the recession which was a fantastic year to graduate in I know (laughs) <laughs> um despite my uh despite my lovely uh education i couldn't get a job anywhere and so i ended up working in a pub for a whole year instead um which wasn't really the promise that i had uh, started off at school if you get great grades and you work your ass off and you work really hard you know all these opportunities will come to you yes. that definitely wasn't my experience um no one was hiring and in fact everyone was being fired instead so it was a real shit show timing to graduate in. Yeah. Um, but I um, I went to work, like I say, in this pub for a year. Um, I wasn't amazing at manual labor, but I was definitely good at talking. So whenever there was a, uh, a thing like, you know, changing the kegs and everything, it was just, a, I was just a disaster with stuff like that. Um, yes. But when it came to, you know, upselling pints to, you know, punters, et cetera, and just being friendly i was very good at that so um so you, so you got people skills right yeah exactly i had people skills and i enjoyed being on my feet and i enjoyed speaking to people um and being sociable um and, and i'd work you know i'd worked in a pub like many times in the summer i've had loads and loads of summer jobs so um when i was my, my parents sorry my dad's family um business was fashion manufacturing right. so he um when i was 13 you know i was going to work in a warehouse in tottenham and you know i spent many summers working in a warehouse packing things um i worked in a pub many times in the summer as well i trained as an fa football coach um Mm. to teach teach kids football so i was always working every single summer every single holiday not every single summer because i just really enjoyed learning uh, having skills and doing things to be honest right um and getting paid to do them, you know, I remember getting paid £50 a week when I was 13 and just thinking that was the most amazing thing ever because that's a lot of money when you're 13. Totally, uh, yeah. So I'd always really enjoyed work um, and would rather generally be working than holidaying because I just find it fascinating. Um, so that's that, that basically led me to, um, you know, being in this position, working in this pub, you know, a bit miffed because it's not what I had planned, but I didn't really care. I was like, I make the best of the opportunity. And I ended up actually befriending a a punter who um, in the end offered me a job because he was like, you know, he ran an advertising agency and he could see that I had sales skills. And he was like, I'll give you an opportunity to start in the industry. And I'd always wanted to go into advertising. Right. So I was really chuffed by this opportunity. Um, the job itself was not the best it was it started at 8 a.m in um uh basically like london bridge um but like 20 minute walk from london bridge station so it was a bit of a shock to the system from late night pub work um started at 8 a.m basically finished at 8 p.m um wow was really hard graft i was 21 and it was paying 12 grand a year which i don't even think is legal but i was just (laughs) happy to have opportunity mm. um so i was working there for this guy and you know over the period of time i'd managed to negotiate myself up to the glorious dizzying heights of 15k a year salary um and the guy was a very good salesman and i learned loads of amazing sales tactics but he was a very 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 questionable shady character um mm. sadly um 
he <clears throat> he had loads of really terrible habits and behaviors and attitudes. Um, he operated on psychological fear. So he was ultimately like a real bully, like a really mm. bad person. Mm. Um, and um, I was going to work miserable. I didn't realize it at the time, but, you know, had some sort of minor depression and just psychological anguish from working with this guy because um, he would just terrorize people working for him. And the reality is um, I ended up having to get a restraining order from him. It got so bad um, wow. because um, he he did something once. He was in Asia on some holiday, on some binge and ended up in prison. Um, and he did a 15 grand payout and basically called me up to say that I had to send 15 grand over to Asia immediately to get him out of jail. And I was like, you don't even pay me that much, like a year. How can I give you that much right now? Um, and he was, he went absolutely mental at me, held a grudge, got out of prison, came home, went absolutely mad at me, like no loyalty, all the stuff. I was like, you're not making any sense. I don't have that much money. Uh, anyway, I ended up genuinely, he ended up like tormenting me, threatening my parents. Um, it's just a completely mad story. I ended up getting headhunted on a sales call by another company, which was great. And I went to work there. Um, and when I, when I joined there, he sent a note round to everyone in the company saying that I'd stolen things. That I was this, that I was that, which is all obviously complete nonsense. The guy was completely psychologically unhinged. Um, um, it was terrible because I got really good training on how to be, uh, you know, how to negotiate and how to use psychological tactics to get people towards yes, like, you know, negotiating over sales and yeah. charm. But mm. seeing on the inside, like the guy had been brought up basically in the 80s environment of sales where everyone just did cocaine and forced people to do a very <laughs> dodgy deals. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Like uh, he once, he once borrowed a thousand pounds cash off this is probably this isn't the most ridiculous story by the way mm. um but he once borrowed a thousand pound cash um off the financial director but after convincing him that that's just what needs to happen he then went with me on a set on a call this was to tui the travel agency i mean he went on with me to a meeting in the west end um before the meeting went into the grosvenor casino in leicester square and put the whole thousand pounds down on red and it was black and he lost the whole thing Whoa. And he then, and that was just a normal day for him. That's just what he does. Um, and I was with him, you know, a 21 year old person getting sales training and stuff. You're like, what on earth are you supposed to be teaching me? So is that, that was literally the point where I was like, this is it. I'm not going to stay here. But anyway. of, course, of course, you know that he was actually your biggest teacher in life. It in many ways, but you know what? Don't validate him because he genuinely still tries to get in touch with me telling me this. I um, know, but that's not the point I'm making. I'm not talking no, no, about the you. sales skills. I'm talking about the war. Yeah, the, the, the bad stuff that's going on with him. Because, yeah, exactly. you know, if you don't see the bad stuff in people, you'll never see the good stuff either. So I agree. But no, yeah, I, agree. I mean, and he's at the everything time. that I never wanted to be. You know, he would sell, he would sell advertising we didn't have. He would tell lies, and you know, I just, I, I just, yeah, it was horrible. And I, you're right, you're totally right. I learned that that was never the kind of thing that I wanted to do. That's right. Um, so I got lucky because, like I said, I was doing a sales call, and the person on the other end was like, you know, I, I don't want to buy the product, but I want to buy you. So can you come over for an interview? And I was like, yeah, a hundred percent. Please, God, <laughs> get me out of this environment. Um, and obviously he went completely mental. This is exactly when I needed the restraining order. Things got really bad. Um, wow. And I still have, because he's just completely nuts. Um, he did, I mean, when I say death threats, I mean full on death threats, but all in writing. So I have an old phone with all the texts of all the things he ever threatened me in writing from him. Oh that's how, God. that's how poor a judgment um, call he has. Mm. So anyway, um, I moved on. And I moved to a new company and the co-founder of that company was brilliant. He took me under his wing. He trained me. Um, and within a couple of years, I was the creative director there um, running really big accounts. I had most of their big accounts. I was I brought in Spotify and Intel and Amazon. Um, and I was just having a great time. But um, he basically decided that he wanted to leave and start a new company because he 
he had come up with an idea, which was an excellent idea. Um, it was really hard to execute and didn't work, as I'll come on to. But um, he basically uh, created a negotiation with uh, an IP, uh, with an ISP, so an internet service provider, to halls of residences. Right. So he worked out that there was an, uh, an ISP that covered about 50% of the university halls of residences. And he could do an advertising partnership where you know, before anyone logs onto the internet, you can basically create a homepage that is like accessed by 50% of the university market. Like every single time they log in at their, at their desk at home where they're so captive, um, which is a really brilliant insight and very smart from him. So he started this partnership um, with them and basically decided he wanted to leave, start a new company and wanted me to be his co-founder, which was awesome. Mm. So my first foray into entrepreneurship was essentially being dragged along by essentially my mentor yes. uh, to start this company with him. But then the reality was very different. Um, the reality was because he'd always been my boss, it still felt like a boss. The partnership was definitely not equal. He was going off. Um, he, he'd become really obsessed with um, scuba diving in Mexico um, and had found this amazing artist who does like underwater sculptures. Um and had basically become like fascinated by this and like obsessed. Um, and so he was spending months out the office and I was having to do all the work. And I was like, this is a completely ridiculous co-founder situation. You're just scuba diving the whole time <laughs> and making me do all the work. Um, now the reality is just so you know, that underwater sculpture product project, which he ended up working on full time has literally taken him to, um, partying with Mariah Carey and Leonardo DiCaprio and around the world and building underwater sculptures in Necker Island. So he's absolutely doing the most amazing stuff. And if you type in underwater sculptures, um, you'll, you'll see he's basically creating new coral reef life from doing it. It's just amazing. Incredible. Like, honestly, amazing. So I'm so happy for him. And we're still really good friends. But yeah. I was very honest with him when I was like, this is not what I had in mind for my first company. It's not an equal partnership. So I learned very quickly um, to understand what I was into and what I wasn't into and what partnership felt like. So I said no to that. I went back to the agency that he'd plucked me from and I carried on working there for a bit. Um, but I had the bug. Um, you know, I'd had a taste of my own freedom, so to speak. And that was tempting. So my oldest friend, Joel, um, who's my co-founder now still, um, is always really entrepreneurial. And he was at PwC, so he'd gone a very different route. Now, he has never not, you know, I went through clearing. He got straight A's and went straight into economics. You know, like he went straight into to his ACA and then management consulting at PwC. And, you know, he just has um, always done incredibly well at, uh, academically. And he's very smart. And he he hated PwC because it's not an entrepreneurial environment. No. And so desperate to leave. So we were always talking about, you know, we'd meet up on weekends and talk about the things we could do. And um, one of the ideas that uh, like we had together was, um, which was a silly idea, incidentally, um, <laughs> we decided to create a company. It was called Deal 52, just because we couldn't be bothered to come up with something better. Um, <laughs> and we basically put advertising on the back of playing cards uh, that had QR codes on them. Right. So um, QR codes, I mean, I was, this is a while ago now. This is like eight, nine years ago. I was 23 or 24. Um, they had, um, like QR codes hadn't really come out um, or they were just coming out. So they were going to potentially be popular, if that makes sense. Yes, no yes, yes. Um, so anyway, we had this idea that, you know, students love drinking games and they love um, playing with cards and Weatherspoons are all over the country. So we basically got a national deal with Weatherspoons where we could put our our playing cards in all the different Weatherspoons around the country. Um, and, um, and, and then students that would come in would scan the cards um, with their phone and there'd be a different drinks deal unlocked every week. So one week would be a Jack and Coke for a pound and one week would be, you know, a vodka Coke for a pound. It's that kind of thing. Yes. So we're like, that'd be really cool because the client would have a back end and they could change the, the drink every week. Anyway. Long story short, mm. um, obviously, a the um, no one scanned any of the cards because, like, that's just they were just there to get their free cards and just have drinks. Yeah, because uh, that was that was pretty predictable. But you know, when you're like young and you like to believe your own lies, 
um, you tell yourself, but no, they'll definitely do of it. Of course they're going to do it, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you you now, convince yourself. Yeah, yeah I mean, fortunately, um, uh, alcohol brands don't really care that much about digital metrics. So because it sounded cool and because um, students were going to see their brands and all this kind of stuff, that was actually enough for them. So they never really had a problem. But um, we had a bit of a problem because... Um, in startup land, there's a thing called MVP, which means minimum viable product. Yes. Um, except we mistook the M for a million and we basically booked a million packs of cards, um, which was a little OTT, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it looks like 54 million individual pieces of card, which is a lot, or, or seven lorries worth of pallets. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> and when I say that was a nightmare, um, we basically, <laughs> uh, we bas basically each thought that the other person had sorted out the logistics. So one day in Borough Market, where we were working, these seven lorries just turned up and dumped these cards on the street. And everyone went absolutely mental at us because we had no means to get rid of them. Now, fortunately, my time working in my dad's warehouses, learning how to drive forklift trucks, came in really handy at that point because there's plenty of forklift trucks in the warehouses of Borough Market. So we were actually able to move things slowly but surely, but it was such a nightmare. Yes. Um, and I think we learned quite a lot from that experience, mostly that um, we, um, we should definitely work together on communication, but also that we didn't necessarily want to do... Um, anything physical ever again no, um, no which is which is by the way an immature response because and, and reality, I, reality, I, it was silly. i'm going to share a tiny story with you so you can catch your breath have a drink of water because I, I totally can sympathize with you i had this um i went through a phase where i only wanted to drink really super healthy water and it needed to be like the perfect ph and a friend of mine, I was still employed. Actually, I worked in a textile industry for 28 years, so we got something in common there. But okay. I, um, uh, a sales guy that worked for me in France introduced me to this French water with a German-sounding name called Wattwiller. And he brought a bottle over, like a little bottle, and he, he got me to taste it, and it tasted beautifully. And, uh, in fact... Um, uh, I don't know, this posh restaurant called, is it The Duck or whatever? They they were selling oh, it in uh, there. Um, the Fat Duck. The Fat Duck, yeah. They were selling it in there. And I knew this was going to, I mean, there's a massive backstory around it. Um, uh, there's a lot more, but uh, this is your podcast, so I'm not, I don't want to take over too much. But I managed to get a, a, a deal with the, the, the distributors that I would become the UK distributor. And I had like a pallet delivered to my home. <laughs> That's, I don't, I'm going to sell this water and I, I've got a warehouse and hired a warehouse and put it in there and I was going to sell this water. And I basically drank, I think, three pallets full of water in, <laughs> in the end myself. <laughs> oh, well, that's amazing. And, uh, and I, again, I vowed then, I said, I will never do anything physical again. <laughs> So yeah, I I definitely can. Well, the thing is, it's such a it, it's such a silly reaction, but I mean, you can't I help know. it because at that moment you feel so strongly about that that that's the problem, not me. It was the medium. Yes, yes. Not yes. the choices. That's right. Um, that's right. So that was uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I've gotten over that now. On reflection, I've realised that you know the, the the right learning is to go deeper within myself and accept that I I'm the idiot, not. <laughs> not physical <laughs> stuff that's um, right that's right anyway it was a humbling experience so anyway we didn't continue with that business because it was just a nightmare and what mm. was going to be nice and profitable was a not really scalable and b just not really that exciting mm. so after we basically lost money on it we're like well that was a good lesson let's move on with our lives which i think was the right response yes um and then um, we, we'd, we'd basically at that point gone full on the bug. So we decided to, um, yeah, we basically decided to start up a, uh, a daily deal site. Right. So if you remember these, these were going crazy all the time. Yes. So it was the days of Groupon. Yes, um, I remember very well. 
So it was like just magical time where we had this arrogant point of view, which is any idiot could start a business in this area right now and do well. Yes. Um, it was true because two idiots tried. Um, <laughs> and so we were like, we found an outsourced software solution from the Ukraine just by Googling. Mm -hmm. um, we found some good deals. I mean, we did a very similar thing to you, by the way. I was I'd stocked a bunch of stuff in my house that we were selling, which was terrible decision but you know we ended up selling it in the end mm. um but we did this deal with hungry house if you remember yes. them yes yeah of course yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um i mean uh, they've now been they've now since been bought but you know for a period they were the number one that's right got, you know, just eat yeah. um but we did this job with um hungry house well this deal with hungry house where um, everyone that signed up to our platform got a free five pound takeaway, um, or, like deal. And every time they redeemed it, we got one pound 50, right. which was the most ridiculous deal because it got on UK hot deals within a minute, um, of going live. And that was, that was that we sold about a hundred thousand of them within a week. Mm. Um, and we just didn't know what to do we were like this this is unbelievable we're going to be millionaires yes. i felt like you know only fours and horses um <laughs> with my rodney um, <laughs> so we were really excited because it was just amazing but the problem was we were obviously completely unable to replicate it right. um so every single time so we got to you know 150,000 sales was about 150,000 customers as well mm. and we just did not know how good that was um whether that was normal or average or amazing, I've since come to realize it's phenomenal. Yes. Um, but that's what, that's what uh, you know, sadly, the struggle in all the other businesses have taught me. Um, but not sustainable. So the problem that we learned with that business uh, quite quickly, we only did that for about five months, was essentially in the daily deal business, you are a glorified middleman. So you don't hold stock. You don't really like have control over your website particularly and the only thing you really have are a bunch of customers who always want a better deal than the week before so and they want to steal your customers as well yeah probably. exactly exactly yeah, yeah. The, the, the thing is there's just there, there isn't a business there it, no. it just it's a good genuinely a very good get rich quick scheme and that is as exactly fortunately how we used it yeah so we were really brutal um we went down to new forest one christmas i remember and just we were knackered because we've been working like 24 7 just doing this stuff and fulfilling orders and whatever and it was just two of us and no employees and we're like you know we could sell this potentially we could like carry on like these are our options but like are either of us happy or enjoying this and we're like absolutely not i hate this and joel was like i hate this so much it's like well if business is meant to make you happy let's definitely not carry on there's no logic no. so we were like okay let's do a test let's email all of our customers and if any of them complain we can reconsider you know we'll say that we're shutting down we'll see if anyone cares anyway emailed at that point i think we had maybe 175,000 customers or something uh, not one response <laughs> oh so we're like exactly as we thought no one cares about us our egos can deal with the damage let's take the money and just be happy with what we've got and yes. not flog a dead horse let's just get out and it was one of the best decisions we made because um we had surplus money that we were able to um put down payments on on homes to get mortgages we had leftover money to start a new business um and basically pay ourselves a like a, a small salary over the next year to start a business that we were actually interested in starting so yes it was a really, really great decision and experience because about that time, Groupon had been, uh, Google had made an offer to Groupon to buy them for $5 billion. Mm. And Groupon had said no. I know. And mm, basically, um, about a month later, the whole thing fell off a cliff. People just I fell out of love, stopped being interested. And that was that. I know. Massive mistake they made. Massive. Massive. Yes. It was so interesting because it just stopped yeah. like that. Like every, everyone in the world just got bored one day. That was it. Um, so we got out just before that, which was, um, you know, neither here nor there, but it was, it felt like the right decision um, from a timing point of view. So that was a really great, 
a really great lesson. And like I say, we were able to start a new company. So we started one called Grabble. Right. Uh, which was essentially in, which is ironic because I always told my dad I'd never work with him. I'd never go into family business. And I'd never work in fashion. And obviously this was fashion. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it was a uh, an online an online fashion website to begin with, like a retailer. Yes. Um, it was a cross between essentially Pinterest and ASOS. Um, but it was overcomplicated. And after a year, we had basically burned through all of our money and our savings and everything else and gotten absolutely nowhere. And we decided to roll the dice and change the product to a mobile only app, shopping app. Right. Um, off the back of that, um, we essentially went viral. We created this app that people went mad for. It got nicknamed the Tinder for fashion. Um, we went straight into the number one of the app store. We um, became the number one shopping app in Europe. We were trending on Twitter. I mean, we trended worldwide on Twitter um, many times. Uh, we became really good at social media and really good at capturing people's attention and having viral campaigns. Um, we were on, you know, the 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 Mail Online um, homepage on New Year's Day. Um, you know, we we just we had this sort of crazy ride from. T turning that around and in that period um we raised um four million pounds um from various angels we became the number one shopping app in the uk for about three months we were the number one shopping app in europe um we had over a million monthly customers um we just blew up it was really exciting we grew Brilliant. from you know just just us two to 35 people like really fast in central london um and you know, we won some amazing awards. We won, like, you know, we, we'd literally had this cringy period at one point, um, you know, in, in tech, everyone reads TechCrunch, which is an pu online publication. Yes. yes. Um, you know, we'd had this thing when we'd done the last business, we were like, you know, uh, kind of bored of doing this, you know, profitable small business thing like the cards and like the daily deal stuff. Like, why don't we do one of those tech businesses that we're always reading about on TechCrunch, you know, raise money and do that thing. Anyway, we um it was very cringy because that's genuinely the conversation that we had which is obviously pathetic but true mm -hmm. um anyway like we won this uh we won best mobile company in europe from TechCrunch. Wow. um you know so we've done like all these things we were super proud of it but the reality is um it was a, like, just terrible behind the scenes. It was so hard to make money. You know, we had lots of revenue coming through the business, but there was just no, it was so different for us because t in the past, you know, we built sustainable things where there was a clear profit margin and you understood how to grow. Yes. In this, it was a numbers game on consumer growth. Um, but, you know, having a meaningful profit margin in fashion in a high growth area is is negligible. It's virtually impossible. Yeah. Um, um we were really suffering from that. So we were always having to fundraise to keep the lights on. It was incredibly stressful. At the point, you know, the true story is the night we won that award, um, both myself and my business partner didn't turn up to the award ceremony because we were so stressed and bummed out. We were both at home mm. drinking whiskey on our own. Mm. Um, I remember this because I was WhatsApping him. And a friend of ours literally sent us a photo of him on stage picking up our award, being like, where the F are you, idiots? And we're like, oh, God. <gasps> like, just so stressed and wow. so bummed out about how hard it was um, that we didn't even turn up for like the award ceremony because we were just too down. Um, so that was a real, you know, tough moment, to be honest, because uh, it sounds on the outside like everything's brilliant, but on the inside of a startup um, in that kind of environment, um, it's really tough. Um, and in the end, the business did fail. Um, and the business failed because we, uh, you know, the reality is we just were never able to clear a healthy profit margin. Right. So we were relying on external funding the entire time. Gotcha. And it's just not healthy. Mm. Um, and you only need one month to go wrong and then it's all game over. And that is essentially what happened to us. Of course. Um, so whilst I really love the ride, um, <clears throat> I'm actually really happy to have said goodbye to it. Yeah. On the basis of I've learned a lot. Um, my you know, number one lesson is um, to start with margin. 
you know, if you can't find a smart profit margin, um, it's just for me personally, but I, I always felt more comfortable understanding where the margin's coming from. You, you know, if you have a healthy margin, you can do great things for your customers as well. You can spend it on them, on yes. delighting them. If you don't have a margin, it's a lot harder to do the extra things anyway. So, um, and like from my days in advertising, I'm all about building a strong brand. Like I really love the idea of creating a meaningful brand that yes. people love. Um, if you don't have a margin, you can't invest there. You can always investing in performance marketing, which is not really a good game. So um, that is... Bye-bye bye, Grabble. Bye-bye Grabble, exactly. And it was a great ride. And I look very fondly um, on the whole thing, but um, I made some amazing friends, um, some great connections. The whole thing was awesome. And then at the same time, you know, I started this podcast, Secret Leaders, towards the end, actually. But, you know, we'd had such good investors in Grabble. Um, you know, who are founders of really great companies. And then they'd in introduce us to their friends and stuff. And whenever I would ask them, I'm a very inquisitive person. So whenever I'd ask them, you know, is this normal, what we're going through? And they'd be like, yeah, shit, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they tell me amazing stories. And I was like, you know, would you be willing to share that story? Because that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and in the end, you know, I started a side project of this uh, Secret Leaders podcast. Um, over three years, that's become a real passion project that's yes. just so much fun. I mean, you obviously know because you host a podcast as well. Yes, exactly, yeah. It's just so rewarding and fascinating hearing people's stories. Most definitely, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and learning and listening to them, um, you know, was part of what gave me um, the idea for my new business, um, yes. which is called Dawn. Mm. Uh, although... A fun fact, it turns out you can't call your company, you can't name it after a sunrise after all. Um, so, How come? Uh, well, no, I mean, you, you, you can. I'm being semi facetious, but actually, it turns out that in America, mm. Dawn is basically fairy liquid. Oh, so, right. Um, always do your research because previously we'd created this company, Grabble. We'd made up a word and made up the trademark and all that stuff. So it was just, it was memorable, but it was kind of a ridiculous word, but whatever. We were like, it just works. Um, this time around, I'm I was really like, I want a real word. I really, really want a company that's a real word so you can build a brand around it. Um, and I just started with Dawn flippantly just to get going. Um, and sadly, we're not able to have it because we have not got our trademark. So we've actually just, we're just going through a rebrand currently for something we can get the trademarks for, which is quite impressive, um, called Heights, um, heights. as in take you to new heights. Yeah. Oh, okay. Turns out the trademarks are all available and so is the domain. So that is going to be our new name. Um, <clears throat> and the, uh, basis of that business, um, if I may, I mean, I've been rambling yes. for a while. You might yeah, actually no, have some... brill brilliant. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm riveted. I'm not going to interrupt you. If I interrupt you, I'd like to add value. Oh. I can't any, add any value because I'm <laughs> loving the story. And yeah, I'd love to hear the revised name Heights. What's going to be yep. happening with that? Yeah, because I had a look and I think everybody needs to know about this. Okay, so um, the idea for Heights came from... When Joel and I were working on Gravel, we were just always, always stressed and always, um, you know, at the edge of our capabilities, I would say, which is pretty much where people like us operate our best. You know, we wouldn't actually have it any other way. Mm. Um, so we had a really fun time, like working on, uh, working on, on these kind of conditions, but always looking to optimize. So how can we optimize our time? How can we optimize what we do? You know, sleeping patterns, meditation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Reading all these productivity things. Um, um, it became like a real fascination. So we both have our own, uh, practices. Like we both do intermittent fasting, which I'm sure you might've heard of. It's basically oh, yes. as, as someone very funny on Twitter said, it's just, uh, there's a great tweet that said, whoever the branding agency that rebranded skipping breakfast to intermittent fasting is a genius. <laughs> 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 um, but you know, we both do that on the basis of getting better mental clarity. Um, and we, you know, we try different things, but we felt like the information is a, bu a bunch of it's woo woo and some of it's science backed. Um, we would always search for science backed stuff where we could. Um, and it's all very boringly written, generally speaking. And it's all sort of dis like disparate. So, you know, it's all, all 
found in loads of different places. So that was one thing that we always noticed. Now, a year ago or over a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, you know, I decided, uh, cause I like to be an environmental warrior. Um, I decided to basically go vegan overnight. So from being a carnivore to just going completely vegan, mm -hmm. um, just like that. Um, which was hard because, you know, I'd probably have two to three meals of meat products every single day for my entire life. Yes. Um, or for the first 30 years of my life and then decided I wasn't going to do that anymore. But I love the challenge because that is the ultimate it's in your mind scenario, yeah. right? So your mind yeah. is in control of in that change. Um, and you know, the first month was horrible and the second month was even worse. And then after a while, you know, it gets easier and, after nine months, I actually found myself, um, you know, after six months, I found absolutely amazing. Mm. Um, but after nine months, um, I actually found that my uh, short term memory was suffering. So on a Monday, if you ask me what I did on a Friday, I just wouldn't be able to remember. And I was like, this is really strange. Like I, I, I basically felt like I had early onset dementia or something, which is really odd. Um, and I was telling a friend about this and they were like, oh, okay, you need to read this book because this isn't actually that uncommon. The book's called Optimum Nutrition for the Mind. Um, and it's by this guy called Patrick Holford. Um, I know it's basically Patrick. the best. Oh, good. Yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> um, a very, a very entertaining man. Um, and just an amazing um, author of nutritional information in general. So I'd never read a nutrition book before at this point. Um I read that book and apart from finding it incredibly engaging, um, I was really interested to learn that he'd basically gone through the same thing. So he tried a vegan diet, gone through the same thing, and then essentially decided to reintroduce fish and eggs because um, the minerals you need from fish and eggs actually are so good for your brain boosting capabilities that um, he argues that you shouldn't actually be removing them. But, you know, if you've, if you've always been vegetarian, for example, then your body learns to adapt. But if you've always been a meat and fish eater and then you just go cold turkey, forgive the pun, overnight, <laughs> um, this is a very common thing to happen. So I was amazed. Mm. Um, I started to eat fish and eggs again, begrudgingly, because by that point I'd lost you know appetite or interest in any of these things. But I started yes. to eat them again. And within two weeks, I was back to normal. And I was just, from that point on, like fascinated by the idea of nutrition for the brain. Yes. As in, I had always heard about nutrition for the body. I'd always, you know, you go to the gym and you have protein and you have carbs and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, no one had ever talked to me. I'd never heard, you know, and bear in mind, like, you know, I live in an entrepreneurial um, like community, essentially in London, where a lot of my friends are also struggling and looking for, you know, the extra 1% or whatever. And you're always talking about tips and tactics and no one had said food. So I was pretty gobsmacked. Um, I became really fascinated in essentially having a brain first diet. So the things you can have to eat for your brain and what you're actually short of. And obviously if you, if you do a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet, you start supplementing a lot anyway. So you go from, if you're me, you know, never really supplementing to suddenly supplementing a lot to make up for the minerals you're losing. Um, um, this whole lifestyle change just really struck me. I thought it was we, incredibly fascinating. I, I We Sorry. could have a whole podcast on this because mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll just give you, allow you to Please get say. your breath back. Um, the, the, I am totally 100% uh, with you on that. I, I mean, I've stopped eating meat. I haven't eaten meat for like 15 years, but yeah. um, I, I studied with Patrick for a while um i'm oh, at the institute of optimum nutrition i didn't go there i i did okay. um, a, a course um i qualified as a kinesiologist and as yeah. part of the course we had to learn nutrition and yep. had all of patrick's books and learned all of his stuff uh, i even went on his um i don't know if you come across his psychocalisthenics um yeah yeah I so have. Peak House, I actually um, became a teacher of Peak House and I taught Peak House for quite a few years. Oh, but God. people were just not interested because they just didn't get, didn't understand it and I didn't get enough people to make it pay for me. But, yeah. um, um, but the other thing, and I don't know whether you are doing this in your research yet, it's really interesting what you're saying about the fish and the eggs and everything because I've literally... So I've I've been more of a pescatarian than vegetarian yeah. for fifteen years. Well, that's what I am. That's what I am now. Yeah. So I'm, but I'm just starting to give up fish now. 
I've start. I've given okay. up eggs. I've given up yogurt, and um, I'm going to see what's going to happen. So it's part of my experiment as well. <laughs> but because um, the reason being, and so there are all these teachers out there with all their theories, and I've come across somebody else uh, in America, and but but before I got came across him. Um, I learn. We've we've been learning. My wife and I were going on this journey together. We've been learning so much about the microbiome in the last yes. few months, and yeah, uh, even to the point that I'm I'm taking it so seriously that I've actually sent a sample off to the American Gut Project or the British yep. Gut Project to go and find out what my microbiome is. You know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. And the point I'm making about the mind, the microbiome, of course, in your gut. Uh, has a direct connection to your brain as to your well. Your brain, yeah, the yeah, and, and the therefore gut, gut brain access. That's right. So, so I wrote an email newsletter about this literally last week. Okay, the content's, actually, the content's actually on our website. I mean, that's I'll, I'll come on to it. But that's one of the things we do now is uh, can we turn some of this very geeky, hard to distill, not very widely distributed in terms of like a consumer uh, facing way? Can we turn some of this stuff? into something people will read and find interesting and make it fun and actionable. Um, this so I just, is, yeah, I just did one on the gut brain axis. Yeah, you are, you are, this is the new health uh, craze. Yeah. You know, I don't want to call it a health craze, but this is the, the what, what you're doing, what you're uh, putting together here is, is, it's without doubt, it's the new, science based um because it's all backed up by science now because they didn't know any of this information before and yeah. and therefore yeah i i'm with you 100 percent. so well done so where where are you at with it and right. where is it so, going to go yeah so this is a great question so basically we um we started looking around um holland and barrett for holland and barrett and boots just as the starting point for what people take for their brain for just general brain health and found things like neurozan and uh you know wellman and uh and the like and then basically realized there's a big opportunity on the basis of um those products retail at about 10 pounds um if you look at the way that they market their products um they actually have a lot of the things in them that are good for your brain, like 100%, like your, your minerals, et cetera. But because of the cost and because of the way they do it, there's an asterisk on the front of their pack. And if you say on the back, it says, if you take this much per day. Um, and you would need basically about 12 to 15 days worth of their product to get essentially what is the equivalent of your daily RDA in mm. if you were to take their supplements. So mm. They're essentially selling a promise on the front and then being honest on the back, and it's all just complete nonsense. Yeah. So we were looking in the market, we're like you know, at this point, we're really interested in um, what we eat and what we can supplement to have just really good brain health, right? So this isn't selling a quick fix. This first product, this is about what does optimum brain health look like, so that you can, um, you know, you can sleep better, you get less anxiety, all these things, you know, that they are circumstantial based on your psychology or surroundings, your community, of course, but having good nutrition for your brain is not something that people generally think of and absolutely should. And um, can we create a brand that is um, very consumer friendly, super honest and transparent about what goes in it and how much you should take and you know no little asterisks everywhere just like straight up facts and honesty and tell you where things come from um and essentially create the ultimate brain multivitamin that you should take every single day create it as a direct to consumer product so you cut out the middleman which means instead of giving a retailer like boots or holland and barrett 50 percent of your margin you just put in double the amount of the dose so the customer gets more Yes. Um, because that's obviously the brilliant thing that you can do thanks to e-commerce, which we obviously have a fair amount of experience in Absolutely. Uh, at this point. Um, we um, we basically just redesigning the experience of the most efficacious brain multivitamin you could possibly take in the market at its price point. So we're looking at it's a premium product. So it's £35 a month, but through your letterbox every single month as a subscription, it's right. two pills a day because it can't actually fit what we're trying to do in one. Um, 
And we're even re we're redesigning the whole experience from the ground up. So each one of those pills is actually two pills in one. So the outer layer is actually algae oil. So we're doing the fish oil, um, but obviously because we want to be able to market to vegans because I've gone through that experience myself. Yes. Um, we've sourced um, pretty much the only manufacturer in the world we could find that has um, algae oil at the same effic efficacy level as the best fish oil. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got this outer layer that's algae oil and this inner layer, which is literally a pill inside the other pill. Yes. Um, which floats in there essentially, and that's your micronutrients. So things like blueberry extract, B vitamins, chromium, you know, a whole bunch of micronutrients that are just amazing for your brain. So each each thing you're taking is two pills in one. Because the other thing we were doing was going into somewhere like Whole Foods, where the quality of the uh, vitamins are good. Um, but then you're buying your fish oil and you're buying this and you're buying that. And after you've spent the equivalent for your daily intake you're spending like 90 to 100 pounds a month yeah, on supplements absolutely. that are good for your brain yeah so we're trying to get into that sweet spot of like can we replace like buying a 100 pound worth of supplements for what you need every day for 35 pounds a month but can we also make sure that we're nothing like the neurozans of this world where just because you can claim it doesn't mean you do it like no one genuinely reads the back and says right well i'm going to take 12 days worth in one day then am no, i you're just no. going to take two a day that's so right. It's a really unusual sweet spot, but that is essentially our our plan is we're building this um, product from the ground up. Um, we're creating, like I say, an, an, an online brand that people can relate to. Um, we've been creating content. We've been doing a newsletter every week for the last two months, which is a three-minute Sunday digest of just three things. One thing from nutrition for the brain, yeah. one thing from psychology, and one thing from neuroscience every single week that comes from science journals, but written in plain English with a bit of fun um, to help you understand like your brain better and essentially promote brain health. Yeah. Um, and it's been going great, Like as in we've raised some money, we've, uh, so we've got some really great investors, um, we've got an office in Soho, a couple of Cambridge science grads to keep it, you know, in the Cambridge story family. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're working with Patrick Holford, actually, he's been doing our recipes, um, which is really cool for me because obviously the journey sort of started with him um, originally. Yes. So, you know, we've got, we've got an amazing group of advisors. We've got him, we've got, um, you know, a couple of dietitians. Our next product we're looking at doing later in the year is going to be, um, hopefully a psychobiotic which is essentially and you might have heard of this but um you've got prebiotics and probiotics which are you know generally good obviously for your gut flora yes um but psychobiotics are specifically the strains that you can extract that are the specific things that impact your mood Brilliant. um so it's a very specific strain it's a brand new field of research led by john cryan who's a professor in uh in dublin um and it's just a really new area and it's really interesting. And so, you know, our whole thing is, can we make the brain sexy? Can we make it cool? Can we make it interesting and engaging? Can we create a brand that people really want to associate with that is a lifestyle brand? Um, the way that we think about the problem is, um, you know, if you look at the protein in the gym market, ultimately, there's two types of protein brands. There's a type that market to you and make you think that by taking that protein, you're going to get massive. Yeah. Um, and then there's the type that, you know, is very honest with you. It's like, we're selling you the protein, but if you don't go to the gym and do the work, nothing's going to happen. Mm. Um, it's the same thing with the brain. It's like, you know, nutrition is a small part of it. Let's be honest, it's 20%. So we really strongly feel that nutrition for the brain is a, you know, nutrition and supplementing for the brain is incredibly valuable and meaningful thing to do because we both do it. But you know, the 80% of where change comes from is your psychology, is your community, is yeah. the choices you make. Yeah. You know, that's the stuff that's going to make a difference in your life. And that's the kind of brand we want to be. You know, we've seen in America, there's a lot of fuss around this uh, space called nootropics. Um, um, that's essentially just selling quick fixes. You know, that's, you know, this is going to make you focus. This is going to make you this, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, yeah, the reality also, is that stuff's not really going to happen. Like, you don't know what kind of day the person's had. And, you yeah. know, it's like we're not going to be selling quick fixes. Like, the change comes from you. That's the reality. And and this is what people don't necessarily understand, of course. 
because everybody is after a quick fix because they just want to just fix me so I can keep going, right? Yeah. But they yeah. forget that actually whatever you've done in the previous six months, 12 months, 10 years, that's what's led to your mind state right in this moment. <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly. So if, if you're not feeding your mind with the, the right nutrition that, that is in terms of your experience um, and the meaning that, that people give to stuff, you know, this is the biggest thing. I, I've, I've come up with this new um, uh, happiness uh, formula. And mm. the, the happiness, well, first, it's, it's, I made it up, but I made it up because I heard other people talk about small bits of it. So the first one, and I, and I know the Dalai Lama talks about suffering, right? So happy, mm -hmm. happiness, first of all, happiness is the absence of suffering. That's number one. Yep. But where does suffering come from? Suffering comes from fear and doubt, right? Yep. If you think about any reaction that people have to anything, I mean, what we're going through at the moment in the UK with Brexit, right? Everything mm -hmm. is fear and doubt. So the media, the politicians, they are feeding that that engine of fear and doubt and putting totally. that in, into our minds, you know. So no wonder people are going to wake up depressed because they've just listened to the news 24-7 where you're hearing all this fear and doubt. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. You can have the nutrition, you can have the pill, but there is a lot more that needs to be done alongside that too. Exactly. So, you know, it's, we want to create a really transparent and honest brand that we can be proud of where everything that we do comes from, you know, some serious science and is just honest, um, not complete bullshit. Um, and I think there's a massive space in the market for that because I don't see that being promoted. I see everything being sold on promises that are dodgy and not really um, yeah. the reality that. at all. Um so, you know, we're really motivated and it feels great to be starting all over again, to be honest with you. Um, uh, and, and completely new, completely new, which I also love. I, I think I, I think it's brilliant and I, I love it. And I, I'll be a big supporter of what you're doing and, and want to get the word out there. So do keep us posted on this. Um, yeah. Well, anyone that wants to um, sign up to the newsletter, we'd be most grateful, which is at, uh, well, most grateful, but also I hope actually helpful to anyone that does, yes. which is um, trydawn.co. Trydawn.co to sign up to the newsletter yeah, and then people will find out you know, the journey that you're on, but also get some tips every week that they can be putting into, into action. Exactly. And we do a nice little thing at the bottom, which is we do community feedback every week. So people send feedback on, you know, what they're liking, what they're not liking. And we put it into the newsletter, which has been getting good response. My favorite one so far that people have been loving is, uh, <laughs> is from my mum, um, <laughs> which is, uh, this is a lot better than I thought it would be, actually. That was the whole <laughs> quote for that week. <laughs> Because you've got to put you, in the good and the bad. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> exactly. Okay, brilliant. I'd, it's been super interesting to hear your story and what you're going to be doing next. And I'll, I'll definitely be following it. Where else can people find you online? And um, Yeah, so um, our Instagram for Dawn is we are Dawn. Um, and so that's at we are dawn and i'm at dan murray serta which is uh, s-e-r-t-e-r -E at the end because that is my wife's family name and i recently got married so on all social platforms i'm at dan murray serta well congratulations on the wedding and um, and the new surname that's brilliant and yeah exactly new, new surname big news i <laughs> uh, well new surname new new wedding or new marriage or <laughs> new dawn new dawn uh new heights whatever it's going to be exactly called. very that good sounds amazing thank you so much for for joining me today and i look My forward pleasure. to hearing more and hopefully we'll meet in person if you're ever up in birmingham way um you know do let me know you align and amazing. and thank you if you want you know, some help with, with perhaps getting some speaking opportunities in Birmingham, let me know as well. I might be able to help you with that. Amazing. Thank you so much for your, your uh, offer and time. All right. Take care, Dan. It's been great fun. Thank you. Cheers. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.
All right, cheers. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 